Public dialogue and civic engagement play an important role in improving the health and well-being of Texans across our great state. That's why Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is a proud supporter of free Texas Tribune events like the conversation you're about to see. Representative King, you've seen hospitals close in your area over the years. What has been the impact on those communities? Well, excuse me, I apologize for my voice. I needed some real, real health care right now. <laughs> but, um, well, thanks for making me go first, Corey. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, no, we, we do see them close, and it's a huge impact. I mean, the only, the only thing that could compare to it is school closures. I mean, mm -hmm. we lose our health care, we lose our schools, we lose our towns. Mm -hmm. um, uh, small communities tend to have a, a more of an um, elderly population mm -hmm. um, who need more health care. So we see, we see a lot of the ones that do have resources move to Amarillo to be closer to their doctors or, or those, those kind of things. Most of the hospitals we have that I, that I in the very small towns that I represent, um, have become a little more than, than uh, trauma centers and, and transfers. And, um, you know, when I was, um, as you mentioned, I was born and raised in Canadian. And mm -hmm. back then, you know, we, they deliver babies in Canadian. In fact, the same doctor delivered my mother delivered me. That doesn't happen in Amarillo, I'm sure. So, uh, but that, but those those services are gone. I think Childress is one of the smaller communities left that still um, delivers babies. And, and Dr. Henderson, I believe, has delivered something like 3,000 babies. Is that right? <laughs> something like that. Um, your patients often travel many miles to see you, Dr. Henderson. Um, what what does lack of access to rural obstetrics mean for for Texas patients? Well, as Mr. King said, Childress is the only hospital between Wichita Falls and Amarillo that still provides obstetrical services. Uh, you can go to Plainview or Lubbock that way. You can go to Abilene South and you go to Perryton North before you get to that Pampa Dumas. That. So we're basically have about a 100 mile radius around us where there's no obstetrical services. And I can tell you things happen fast when your water breaks or whenever you're bleeding or whenever you have a complicated pregnancy. And uh, so to me, it's just an essential service, not, not, a, not a luxury. It's an essential service to be able to deliver babies there because, as I say, things happen quickly and can go bad. And we can get good outcomes if we have access to care. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Phillips, what has been your experience in in communities that have lost a hospital? What does it mean for those communities? Well, thank you for that question, and i um, glad to be here today. Thank you, uh, for WT, for hosting us. Beautiful facility. And all my friends out there that I got to see again today, it's, it's sure good to see you, Carolyn, especially you. So now, Don, don't get offended that I recognize Carolyn first. But anyway, I want to call y'all's attention to something that the Tribune did. Oh. It's a, a great little piece. Um, a Dying Town is the name of it. Uh, Chris Collins and Sophie Novak did it in November 4th, 2019. It's the Texas Observer, but it was a great piece. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, yes, it okay. is to be Observer. You're right. That's sorry. Right. Sorry about that. But the, it, it tells a story about what happens in the town. It talks about Clarksville. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we see that's an impact because people have to travel, and because healthcare isn't accessible to them, is mortality. Mm -hmm. So when Gilmer closed, when East Texas Medical Center closed that hospital, when Clarksville closed, when Bowie closed, what happened in those communities? Representative King said it. Well, the first thing that happens is you have uh, employers who leave mm -hmm. uh, because of OSHA standards and other things like that, you need to have that kind of care readily available, and it's not. Uh, the OB care that Dr. Henderson, who's famous because he's the father of John Henderson with Torch. John, I know you're in this audience. Where are you? <laughs> there you go. There you go. And that's a great guy right there uh, advocating for did small well. hospitals. And <laughs> yeah, you did. But anyway, uh, so you, you lose your economic base. When you lose your economic base, your schools lose their tax dollars. People start migrating out. If you want real live examples real close by, take a drive down to Hale Center. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been at Texas Tech University Health Science Center 11 years now. Mm -hmm. 
I remember going through Hale Center about 20 years ago. A vibrant community with a hospital that closed in between those two dates, five years. It's boarded up. Mm -hmm. uh, people move away. What's the question really? Well, the real question is what is the right size, type, characteristic of health care where the economics of the situation no longer support a hospital? Mm -hmm. That doesn't relieve us from the responsibility of rightly funding hospitals. Um, but what is the right size of health care? Um, Dr. Nancy Dickey's written a very nice piece about this in Texas Medicine, um, a roadmap kind of piece, good, good start. We have to be innovative in how we, you, think about this solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Ms. Jeffries, you work in a number of counties that don't have any hospitals. You did not set out to open clinics. How did you stumble upon this work? Well, I was actually faculty here at WT, and we were working on some things, too. Um, it was within WT's mission at that time to provide um, services and outreach to rural health areas. And so um, I worked on that project trying to get a clinic going. And the timing just wasn't right for WT. But after you developed those bonds with the community and talked to the school district and things like that, there was no way I could leave them with nothing. And so um, we just I still worked here for a while and started that clinic. And, and, and honestly, it served two purposes, because here at WT, we also needed places for our students to go. And so that was a great place where they get to experience rural health day in and day out and really get a lot more opportunity than they would in, in a larger metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. So it was the perfect to both worlds. Great, thank you. Um, and I want to go back to that Texas Observer story that you mentioned, because one of the things that, that um, is mentioned in that story is about how Texas uh, did not expand Medicaid. And I wanted to turn to you, Representative King. Um, why hasn't the legislature expanded Medicaid in Texas? We have in our state the highest rate of people without health insurance. Hospitals take on a big part of caring for the uninsured. Wouldn't it help those rural hospitals if, if Texas were to expand Medicaid? I no, because the reimbursement rates aren't going to go up. Um, it still takes physicians um, too long to get, get reimbursed on, on um, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, what would help more than anything is if we had competition, if we could mm -hmm. provide insurance, if we could cross state lines to, to look for in, um, insurance companies or underwriters. And I think Texas is down to three providers. That's why your premiums continue to go up. You know, five, four years before Obamacare was implemented, my, in my personal business, I saw my premiums go up almost 50% during that time on a, this might happen. So when there's no competition, insurance companies can charge whatever they want to, and they do. You know, the model of an insurance company is to charge the consumer as much as possible and pay as little as possible. Mm -hmm. So when there's no competition, that's what's going to happen. So in, rather than expanding Medicare, um, Medicaid, I want to see the federal government repeal more of Obamacare and open up competition across state lines. Okay. Dr. Phillips, is he right on Medicaid? Well, I think I, I would compliment the legislature. Actually, they spent $79 billion this year uh, to shore the system. If you all know about the 1115 waiver, I know it's got two components. I'm going to talk about them in reverse. The uncompensated care is essential. Um, that is the, the care that is not paid for because people are poor, uh, disenfranchised, don't have insurance, those sorts of things. And you can have 50 um, insurance cards out here, and if you don't have an infrastructure, it doesn't much matter. So that uncompensated care, I think, John, this is your statistic from your study, is about $2 million a year for a small rural hospital. Uh, that's essential that we find ways to keep the payments occurring. You mentioned, Representative King, the, the delay in payment. We looked at that uh, a few years ago. In some cases, for some kinds of care, it was 180 days. I don't know about you or y'all out there, but I'd love to call Visa tomorrow and say, say I'm going to pay you in about 180 days and see what happens <laughs> to your card. We've got to find these payment reform systems. The other side of it is the innovation, mm -hmm. uh, disrupts what it's called. 
And so those are things that are innovations like telemedicine is one, mm -hmm. uh, nursing care for diabetic conditions and other chronic conditions. There's another, I, we could go on. There, there were mm -hmm. a, a 128 innovations that are meant mostly to uh, uh, support people who can't pay. But the fact of the matter is, the innovations are so good. For, for example, the diversion from overutilization by mentally ill people of ERs. That's gonna mm -hmm. benefit all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what it looks like. I worry about it a lot. Several people out here and up here do. We'll find a system, and here's what I would plead. Let's think about it like this. What is the best solution for a problem? It's the closest solution. Mm -hmm. That means local people solving their problems. So I guess I'm gonna give away my politics here a little bit, although I'm not a political guy. I like as little government as is possible to accomplish the end that we want to achieve. And it's people like Dr. Henderson down there who are closest to the problem that can figure out a solution that works best for him. Great. And that may not be a solution that works mm -hmm. over in Tyler, Texas. Mm -hmm. So we gotta be flexible in how that looks. I'm pretty confident that our folks in Austin, and I would say this even if you weren't sitting here, <laughs> but I really do have a lot of confidence in those who are down there. They're well studied, mm -hmm. they often uh, have disagreements, but they find ways to work around them. It's a little bit different than down and, there in D.C. And if I can just jump in here, we'll, we'll, we're going to get in a minute to the um, to innovations and, and hopefully sure. telemedicine sure. and so forth, but I just want to mention, since you brought up the 1115 waiver, we're talking about this um, this $25 billion agreement between Texas and the federal government. It's set to partially expire in 2021, and there's a lot of concern of what that could mean for um, for Texas and specifically for, for rural hospitals. But I want to change gears just slightly. Um, so Texas has 35 counties with no doctor. Um, and Ms. Jeffries, patients in those counties are often treated by nurse practitioners such as yourself. But you say that you face a lot of red tape when it comes to practicing in Texas because of having to be um, supervised by a doctor. Tell me about that. Why is that a problem for you? Why is that a problem for patients? Well, it's a problem for patients, first of all, because it decreases access to care. And so the studies show that um, uniformly across the region and, and states that do have full practice authority for nurse practitioners have, um, they show several things, um, improved patient quality, increased access to care, and also decreased cost. One of the things I've been saying for years, and, and now Texas is actually 51st in the U.S., with regards to access to care and affordability. Um, and a few years ago, I was saying, hey, we're 47th, we're 47th, we gotta do something. Um, so we're now 51st, so really we have to do something. The urgency is there. Um, our model is different than the hospital model. Our model is to keep patients out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we do everything possible to give them quality care and meet measures to prevent hospitalizations and expense as well as just quality of life for them. Mm -hmm. So the Texas Medical Association says that it's not appropriate for nurses to practice independently as if they were physicians, in part because they don't undergo the same kind of training that, that doctors do. And TMA would also argue that granting nurse practitioners more authority, such as being able to prescribe medicine, would not actually lead to a bunch of nurses moving to rural Texas. So how, how exactly would it lead to better access to care? What would you say to their arguments? Well, again, I was trained with evidence-based practice. So mm -hmm. the evidence says that in states where full practice authority is, you do have more nurse practitioners. And uh, so that's, that evidence is there. With regards to nurse practitioners practicing to the full extent of their practice, they're, mm -hmm. trained, they're trained to practice that way already. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, there, there are several things that are heading that way with regards to a recent, even Trump, um, just in October, released um, his White House paper that stated that part of the Medicare reform in, in his response to Medicare for All stated that one of the things they were going to do was decrease regulation so that people could practice, all professions really practice to the full extent of their practice, mm -hmm. because the evidence is there that that does improve access to care. Dr. Henderson, where do you fall here? Do you agree with the TMA here, or do you agree with Ms. Jeffries? I'm not here to advocate for the TMA, I can tell you that. <laughs> I, I believe that 
nurse practitioners and physician's assistants are, are probably the key to access to rural health. I believe that. I've, I've precepted nurse practitioner students and PA students for the last 16 years, and, and I work with them every day. Mm -hmm. I would say that the key is to practice within the extent of your training and your skills and your abilities, and that varies from doctor to doctor. I do not practice independently. Mm -hmm. I consult our nurse practitioners. We've got a pediatric nurse practitioner. When I've got a child that's behind on immunizations, I go to Lori and I say, Lori, what's the catch-up schedule here? She knows that better than I do. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and I told the lady here today, the most important thing, decisions I make is what do I not know and where can I get help? And in rural medicine, I think that's a huge thing. So uh, I, I'm not going to get into the debate about licensure and, and all that, but I will say that we've got to use them and we've got to work together if we're going to survive. That's what I'd say. Representative King, is there the will in the legislature to, to make changes like what Ms. Jeffries is talking about to get more, more authority for nurses? Oh, there's definitely the will for, for some of us. I mean, you're talking of any time they, what they call these TMA fights or scope of practice. Scope of practice. It's, uh -huh. a, it's a turf war. You know, nobody, nobody wants to give up their, their piece of ground. Mr. Freeze. Bill, she threw a call because mm -hmm. I have to go home. <laughs> and I'm not going home voting the wrong way. So, and you know, my, my daughter is uh, headed down the nurse practitioner track next year. Um, it, it's very important. And um, I personally, I'm a big believer in what Holly's doing. Um, mm -hmm. she, she is only in healthcare in two of my counties. Um, I hope you expand. We need it. Uh, but I also um, think that. Uh, we have to we, we have to get over ourselves in the legislature and not all it can't always be about protecting turf at some point policy has to win over politics mm -hmm. and I, I think there is an appetite for that mm -hmm. okay thank you um, dr. Phillips what are the barriers to recruiting providers to rural Texas and retaining them well there are a lot of barriers let me come back to this one if I could no, go and ahead. Then I'll, yeah, sure. it's somewhat related let sure. me just say that uh, the first year I was out here, coming from UTMB Galveston, um, I decided that I would drive everywhere I went. That, that was really a functional decision because you can't fly anyway. Southwest <laughs> just won't cooperate. So I drove everywhere, and I would stop in places like Ballinger and get acquainted with the staff there. I think that's when I first met you, Dr. Henderson. I think Holly was still in diapers at that time. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> any rate, I, we, we got acquainted, and, and what we've observed is simply this. When it comes to the delivery of rural health care, the folks out there work in teams. Mm -hmm. I, talk, I brought that back to our faculty and our schools. And we have pharmacy, medicine, nursing, health professions, several disciplines there. And we said, you know, if that's how the practice is, let's educate that way. Mm -hmm. let's let's educate people to do what really occurs in everyday town West Texas and that's team-based care mm -hmm. and dr. Henderson just mentioned how it looks it in his place it's how I've seen it just about everywhere so we're actually educating our folks to understand each other to communicate with with each other to know the limits and and the extent to which they can rely on each other, mm -hmm. and they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that in the long term is gonna be the best thing that could happen for rural health care. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we do about physician shortages? So I would submit to you that except maybe for my old aerospace medicine residency in Galveston, that we don't have shortages there. But in every other discipline, of medicine, nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, I could just make you a list. And if we start talking about mental health care, yeah. an even longer one, we have shortages and they're not just rural. Mm -hmm. So how do you solve that? Well, I think our very best ways to do that are to work with kids when they're very early in their decision-making. Mm -hmm. 
I have a daughter who is an ER nurse. From the age of four, she told me she was going to be a nurse. She never wavered from that. Mm. She is practicing today in Lubbock, Texas. Mm. And, and so what I'm going to say is, let's take kids who are from here, educate them here, keep them here. I love your plan, doctor. It's wonderful. Texas, West Texas A&M is reaching out the idea that small town values are important and building upon that. We can all build upon that. And we can do that as we grow our own because, you know, the fact of the matter is that's what we have to do. That and means, Dr. Henderson, I'm sorry. Just one more Go thing. One, what that means is more residencies, mm -hmm. more innovative programs like the Area Health Education Center. Tommy Sweat runs the one here that work with kids in high schools and junior highs. That's how we do it. Is it a quick fix? No. Mm -hmm. But is it a long-term fix? Yes, it is. Thank you. Dr. Henderson, there's a, there's a homegrown program in your area as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Yes, there are people in the audience could tell more about it than I could, but we <laughs> decided, and, and let me address that in relation to this. Sure. 41 years ago, there was a hierarchy in medicine. Mm -hmm. That's when you started practicing. Yes, and that's... The doctor was here, and then each step down, there was somebody with a different level of skill set. Mm -hmm. And that has transformed appropriately to a, what I've heard called like a wagon wheel, where there's a center with the spokes going out, each one contributing to the integrity of that wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. And we have to utilize all of our personnel, everybody, to make that wheel roll. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was thinking. Now, to do that, you've got to have those people. And I guarantee you, this team-based approach at our our chief nursing officers here can, just, can certify that. One of the most dramatic things we do is either a high-risk OB or an, a, a code in an emergency room. Mm -hmm. And you believe I don't depend on our certified our, uh, ER nurses to help me run those codes, and I take their advice absolutely, mm -hmm. okay? And so I think anyone who's trained and qualified and comes a part of that team needs to be doing it. Now, to do that, you've got to have those spokes on that wheel, mm -hmm. and that means you've got to have those personnel. We've had a program, uh, how long, John? 15 years, 20 years, we call it the Homegrown Program, where we identify people who uh, are from the area, like Dr. Phillips said, that from the area that will be more likely to stay. You run an ad and get an RNN, but if you train one, raise one up one of your homegrown people, they're more likely to stay. In exchange for paying for their education, they give us back a, a time commitment to serve, and most of the time that stays. And our success, I heard the numbers the other day, is incredible. I think that there is less than a 3% default rate on those things, and uh, then we've had some illnesses that, that made it extend, but by and large, we've been very successful, and they stay. So you gotta mm -hmm. select people, and it starts in high school, like you're saying, and like West Texas is doing here, is to get those kids early uh, and get them directed, and, and they'll come back and stay. Mm -hmm. We've, I think that one of our great successes has been the ability to recruit and retain, mm -hmm. and that's why I think that we're doing well. And Representative, the state has a, a loan repayment program that's encouraged doctors to practice in, in rural areas, but what else should the legislature be doing to, to recruit health providers to rural Texas? Well, the, the loan repayment um, program <coughs> has went away and then it when we brought it back and mm -hmm. and I you know I think that's important but to not everybody wants to live in Morton mm -hmm. you know and so whether it's uh you know I, I deal more with the public education world but the school teacher shortage yeah. is a lot the same as our medical um, yes. staff shortage mm -hmm. and and the grow your own programs that that the state is encouraging um, is the key to it but these small communities they've got to make it cool to live in their town again. I mean, they've <laughs> got to make, it, it's, it's every individual who lives in these small communities' responsibility to make something cool that these kids want to come back to. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, your town will go away. Mm -hmm. And without health care and without education, it is a certainty that mm -hmm. your town goes away. So, you know, I think everybody has a responsibility. I don't think you should put it on the back solely of the government. I, I agree with um, Billy um, over here on... Um, Less government is better government. You know, very little in that pretty pink building in Austin 
Very little good comes out of that place if, when you think about it. You know, <laughs> there's 7,000 bills every session plus written. Does anybody in this room think there's 7,000 good ideas in Austin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. We can do it better. We can do it more efficient at the local level. And, and you know, and that, and that's individual responsibility. But the things the state can do is encourage the loan repayment for service to rural Texas. We can um, sponsor Grow Your Own programs mm -hmm. on a limited basis. Well, rural Texas is losing population. Ms. Ms. Jeffries, how do you recruit people? You employ something like, what, 20 people. How do you, how do you recruit them? Well, we do exactly what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I can't help but think of one of the girls that we have right now who was introduced to us through high school, mm -hmm. came over and, and did a little stint with school that was required and then came and applied. And so she was 16 mm -hmm. and when she started. That was 10 years ago. And so she worked at our front desk. First, she just observed for a while. We, we turned those into paid internships. She worked at the front desk, answered phones, then made copies or what have you. And then as she got into nursing school and went here to WT, as she did that, she continued working. And then she worked in the back once she got her first semester of nursing school under her belt. And, and she's back in school. She's been an RN for us now for a number of years. And now she's back in school to be a nurse practitioner. So mm. she's going to be one of my providers in the future. And uh, that's the way we do it, mm -hmm. is we, same kind of program, as Dr. Henderson talked about, we try to grow our own. And that's the best way to do it. You pick up those kids, they want to stay in that area. And they love family and small town. And you, you don't necessarily get somebody from big metropolitan area and plop them into us. <laughs> they won't be accepted either. <laughs> you, have, you have to be from Childress. Nobody goes to Childress. <laughs> And so you'll think you'll keep these people. They're not just gonna. This woman is not gonna stay for a year or two. You think she'll be here? Absolutely, for she'll be. And she and they tell us that they're like, we want to stay with you forever. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and and one day I won't be here, and hopefully I'll leave it to a good, you know, good people like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, telemedicine. And Dr. Henderson, um, you say that that some things work better than others when it comes to telemedicine. Can you tell me what your experiences have been and? Yes, we've, we've been involved in that uh, for several years and uh, with the closures of the hospitals and even the clinics around us, mm -hmm. like in Hall County and Cottle County, we've uh, tried that uh, and had varying success, but there are some things that work really well. Telepsychiatry has been a huge boom mm -hmm. for us. It's been something that's been probably the most successful thing we've done because it's basically a television interview. We're sitting here talking almost like we can. Mm -hmm. Whereas some things just got to lay hands on them, you know, and so that's, that's... Like what? What doesn't work as well? Well, believe it or not, we can listen with stethoscopes. We can hear heart sounds, lung sounds. We can look in ears. We can look in eyes with telemedicine. We can do that. But there's some things that if you say you've got abdominal pain, mm -hmm. you know, well, where, well, around here, and sometimes you just got to see what their response to our exam is. Mm -hmm. And so there's some of those things that haven't worked quite as well. Uh, allergies, you can diagnose those over the phone. So, I mean, there's some things that you can do very well there, but I think telepsychiatry, teledermatology has been real good. Mm -hmm. We can actually magnify the lesion and make it look better than when I'm looking at it myself. It looks better on the screen than it does when I look at it. Mm -hmm. You can't feel it. You can't do stuff like that. But it's very good. So there's a lot of things work well. And with new it, it, technology, it's getting better. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Phillips, I know Texas Tech has been a real leader in this area. Can you tell me what's going on lately? What, what about um, telemedicine and with EMS? What's going on with that? Well, we have a, a, you know, a very innovative program called the Next Generation 911. Okay. Some of you all know about that program. We run telemedicine equipment in the back of EMS trucks. And uh, it's growing in its adoption. What it allows, it, it, there's always been standing orders between ERs and trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, this allows that ER physician or nurse or team that's going to receive that patient through the back door a chance to put eyes on that person, mm -hmm. that particular case coming in. And that gives us a couple of three advantages. One is, uh, very often, it doesn't need to come where we're headed, which is a trauma one or two facility. They can stop off and get care much quicker that way. So they can triage on the fly. Mm -hmm. The second thing is sometimes, and, and I'm thinking about telemedicine here, is just a tool. And sometimes putting your eyes on something changes your perspective on it. And you better know how to plan for what you're going to do next. 
And so that when you do roll that person in to wherever they're going to be, the team is ready to render the right-sized kind of care that the case is necessary. Mm -hmm. They don't have to stop off and redo all those labs or run that particular image or whatever it is. And so we're really happy about that project and its successes. I think it has great merit. But I think that more for this reason than the ones I just mentioned. Think about your EMS service providers where you are. Those trucks sit there and idle a lot more time than they actually roll on cases. What are they? They are mobile emergency rooms. They have telemetry. They can do a lot of things. Well, if we have access to care issues and we can go down here to Happy, Texas, y'all know where Happy is? Well, there's a truck that sits there. It's an un underutilized primary care station. Mm. Why couldn't we think of innovative ways to use that stationary truck when it's not in that use to provide primary care to people that need that? That, by the way, is not telemedicine. That's called telehealth. Managing your diabetes or your hypertension or whatever your chronic condition is in that elderly population that's common in our areas can be done with high tech if we can connect to people like Dr. Henderson using the telemedicine component. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say one other thing. Technology is exploding, y'all. We're teaching every medical student and nursing student how to use ultrasounds. Hmm. Point of care ultrasound will revolutionize what can be done in the field. It'll make stethoscopes and things like percussion hammers and maneuvers we all had to learn, palpate a belly or whatever, obsolete so we can actually look inside with the sound wave. Hmm. And that's the kind of thing we have to get ready for. We have to be on a phone with. app. Huh? On a phone app. <laughs> yeah, on a phone app, that's yeah, right. Yeah. It's in our pocket right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. EKGs in our pocket right mm -hmm. now. So we're going to have a period of cultural lag that we all have to get used to because as we perturb the stream or the pond, there are going to be waveforms that disturb that surface tension. It's not going to be real calm in some places. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Jeffries, what has been your experience with telemedicine? So, same as Dr. Henderson, we used it for telepsychiatry, which is very successful in that, mm -hmm. um, with the shortage of, of healthcare providers. If you have access to one during that, you can do quite a bit. And that's been particularly beneficial at Cal Farley Boys Ranch, where we have quite a few adolescents who are probably more adept to needing psychotherapy because of the background they come from. Mm -hmm. um, but we also use that in Carson County. Mm -hmm. um, and we take care of uh, the gel. So we save, you know, before we came, actually they drove all those inmates when they needed anything to the ER, you know, 60 miles away. So we not only saved them in that, but the ER cost as well. So definitely um, the utilization in that has been beneficial. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and there's been just a couple mentions of, of mental health here on this yeah. panel, and I just wanted to ask you, Representative King, I know um, access to mental health care is especially an issue in, in rural Texas. What do you think the legislature should be doing there? Well, I think um, the, it goes, the telemedicine, in particular mm -hmm. the, the psychiatry piece of it, has been huge for our counties. Every county I represent, the biggest drain on, on the county budget from the sheriff's office is the jail. And it's because mental health, mental health has become a word that's a catch-all for everything, it seems like. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have to arrest people for being vagrant. And then these counties, um, in lieu of telemedicine, they have to drive them for a mental health evaluation. In a lot of my counties, um, there's no beds in the top 26 um, counties other than around Amarillo. So a lot of my counties will go all the way to Del Rio at times. And so they send two deputies to send That's a, not close. Yes. They send a, 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 two deputies to Del Rio to drop the person off, huh. and they have their mental health evaluation. Mm -hmm. They kick them out. Then they have to go back and get them and bring them back and release them, and then they arrest them again for being vagrant. Huh. I mean, it, it's an ongoing cycle. You know, I think what I would like to see on mm. the mental health 
scale. I would like to see a partnership with Texas Tech uh, and the top 26 counties and the bottom 22 counties of South Plains, and we all share beds. Mm. Let's build a facility, or re and, and actually Texas Tech is working on this already, uh, reutilizing some of these defunct hospitals and clinics. And what the idea is, is let all these counties say, a small town like Canadian, we need five beds a year. Mm -hmm. But we only use three of them. Well, where you have the ability to sell those extra beds to the bigger counties that, that need them over the year. Mm -hmm. And so when counties take personal responsibility and start investing in their own, the legislature will fund it. Mm -hmm. But the legislature will not fund first. That's mm -hmm. not how this works. I mean, the legislature is closing um, hospitals now because there's no money to run them. So I think our, our rural counties have to come together and partner and partner with our um, universities. And, you know, we have the Health Science Center. It's, it makes perfect sense to do this. And what I like, Texas Tech's model of, of taking these defunct hospitals and clinics that are in all these little towns that are not being used, and we're revitalizing them now. It's, but as you were saying, there's not a quick fix to this. This is something that takes mm, time. Great. Well, our time is actually almost up. I have one last question I wanted to ask Dr. Henderson. But meanwhile, if anybody here has a question for the panelists, you can start making your way to this microphone over here and we'll do the, the Q&A section in a moment. But Dr. Henderson, you're gonna be retiring in February um, after a, a career as a, as a doctor um, in rural Texas. What, as you retire, what is sort of your, your greatest hope for rural health care in Texas? That we just get better. Yeah. Because we have. Mm -hmm. uh, our hospital is better now than it's ever been. And I'm, I'm able to leave with a measure of contentment that no one can imagine. My son and my wife and my nurse there can't believe that my mind is as good as it can with so much of my life has been medicine. Mm -hmm. Being Dr. Mike has been so much of me. And, uh, and yet, because of our new young doctors and, and our middle-aged doctors, and we fortunately have a doctor in every decade from 70s down to 30s. And so it looks good for us, but I would hope the others can do that. And they're going to do it by getting behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, towns have to support their doctors and their hospitals. They've got to, they, they it said that 80, 85% of the things that come in, we can treat. Okay, so treat it. Use your people and support them. Make them. I hope you. And I'm so pleased to see this many people interested in rural health. I mean, we live in a little island down there, and to see all y'all makes me happy. And this is going to be the future right here. What y'all are doing. I, I really appreciate each of you being here. But as I think about these these young doctors having the things they need to do to practice good medicine, it makes me happy and contented. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, Thanks to all of you. Let's get some questions here from the audience. Go ahead. First off, uh, I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to have this today. I think there was some really awesome points made, and especially about uh, sharing responsibility and who's allowed to provide care, because at the end of the day, it's not, again, it's not physical therapists versus nurses versus physicians. We, do, we don't stand to lose the most in hospitals. It's the patients who stand to lose the most. And uh, my brother in California uh, was obviously not able to make it today, but he had some questions that he wanted me to ask for him. Uh, the first to Representative Ken King. Uh, why do you think that HB 1584, a bill allowing for the availability of prescription grub, uh, drugs for stage four metastatic cancer was able to pass this year, while HB 670, a bill expanding coverage for ovarian cancer testing and screening wasn't able to pass? In your opinion, what was, the, what was different about the substance of the bills that the legislature was about to pass, one helping patients in late stage cancer, but not the other helping expand women's coverage to diagnosis cancer? Thank you for bringing both of those forward. So very detailed question about a couple of bills from this session. Or, yeah. Do you happen to be familiar with the, that legislation, Representative? Or? Oh, I'm going to knock this one out. Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> so here's the deal. To, to your point. And if you've noticed, this is Teal Tuesday. Teal was ovarian cancer color. My mother died of ovarian cancer in 2013. A colleague of mine, um, Kyle Cassell, uh, lost his mother to ovarian cancer. So in 2015, um, well, actually in 2013, we created the KK125 Ovarian Cancer Research Foundation. The, 120, the KK is obviously for King and Cassell. Um, the 
125 refers to the CA-125. So CA-125 at that time in 2015 was the only predeterminate for ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is much like pancreatic cancer. By the time a woman knows she has it, the horse is out of the barn. My mother, case in point, had she had a CA-125 four years before she was diagnosed, she'd likely been here today. Her treatment for that $80, after that $80 blood test could have cost less than $100,000 and a possible cure. It is curable, folks. She didn't have it. Nobody knew about it. Why didn't she have it? Because insurance companies wouldn't pay for it. Here's the difference. In 2012, 39% of women diagnosed with cervical cancer died. We test for that. Over 80% of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer died because we don't test for it. Mm -hmm. Testing, early detection is the key. So I'm getting to your question, and this is where I'm going to tell you a good story first. So back in 2015, before all this um, speaker transition, and I actually had some stroke, um, we, uh, Kyle Casal and I um, went on this mission to help women. And he, pa he, pa he authored a bill that um, said, if you are terminal, your doctor can prescribe you any drug that they see fit that's been phase one FDA approved. Ovarian cancer is a good, good point. You go talk to the researchers at MD or Baylor or um, probably these doctors here I think would back me up. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that the BRCA1 gene and the bad kind of breast cancer that still kills women and ovarian cancer are the same cell. It's the same cancer and they think it could have started in the fallopian tube because the cell is the same size as a fallopian tube. We've been curing breast cancer for 40 years. But if you get an ovarian cancer diagnosis and your doctor wanted to give you a breast cancer drug, they couldn't do it in the state of Texas. It's moronic. You can do that now. We changed that law. The other thing we did is we said a CA-125 was an insurable item on a well woman exam. And I am proud to say that um, next month, um, Robin, my wife, and I and um, our foundation will be giving a $50,000 check to um, Dell Medical Center for the first trial for the CA-125 to test women for free over the next 10 years. So we passed those two bills, um, and it, it made a, it's made a huge difference. Um, our foundation has really done, done some great things. So when we passed the, uh, the insurance bill, that was a mandate. Republicans don't pass mandates. When you say mandate, Republicans run. That's what happens in the State House and in the Senate. Guess what? We had a unanimous vote on the House floor, we had a unanimous vote on the Senate floor, and we had a sitting Republican governor sign it. He didn't just let it pass, I've got the pen. Y'all come to my office, I'll show it to you. It's cool. So we, we passed this bill. Fast forward into the 17th session. Um, we had a senator who, why he doesn't want to test for ovarian cancer, I don't know, because he's got a house full of beautiful daughters and a wife. He's got too, way too many ovaries to be hating on the girls. So. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, what I tried to do is I tried to expand the CA-125 legislation to say any um, blood marker test or liquid biopsy test that the, um, has been approved for testing for ovarian cancer because in the preceding years after the CA-125, there's about four other tests that need to be paid for by insurance companies, but currently, so anyway, the senator has all the ovaries, he killed the bill because it was an insurance mandate, and I guess he figured 15 was my shot to get over my mother, and I had to move on. Whatever. So we come back in 17, and I tried to pass the same bill. Um, and frankly, um, it just didn't go. I didn't even get it out of committee this time. I don't know, as you can tell, my passion for curing ovarian cancer in our, life, in our lifetime has not waned, and it will not wane. Some of my colleagues have forgot. Um, unfortunately, it takes a tragedy like losing a loved one to remind you what is truly important. But I'll tell you this stuff, like the 15 bill, when I saw the legislature come together, it made me the most proud to be your state rep, a state representative, whether I'm yours or not. There's only 19 of us west of 35 folks, I'm everybody's. So <laughs> we, uh, but what made me so proud to be in the state house during that time is politics lost to policy. That hardly ever happens. I got politic this time. You know, we had a transition in leadership, and I, frankly, I wasn't on the A team this time, but we're, I'm working my way back up. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, it wasn't as easy for me to move a bill. But your question, your brother's question, really hits home with me, and we're going to keep working on it. 
Representative, you did knock that out of the park. And, Sorry, um, I, I, ta I talked as much as <laughs> Billy. We got to <laughs> We're going to go to the next question. Thank you. I, I'm not going to direct this that. question to I'm that guy, that I can tell all. you. <laughs> uh, money seems to be driving our system this day mm -hmm. out of control, and market forces don't seem to have much force in terms of mitigating the costs, the rising costs. And I see construction sites everywhere telling me that that's where the money is today. How do we mitigate that? How do we get a culture change that takes the capitalistic drive to make money out of health care? Mm. Thank you. Dr. Phillips, you want to take that? No, but I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say this. Um, I'm going to look at all of you all, and I'm going to say this. If you really want to change health care, you are the people who have the power to do it. Because I know one thing about this man right here. If you call him about your concerns, he will listen to you. If 30 of you call him, he'll listen a little harder. And if 100 of you call, he's going to do something about it. And he Please don't. Yeah, I'm not advocating that, okay? And don't remember that when I come see you in the session. But... No kidding. You all are silent out there. You don't speak up. You don't ask for transparency in the system that would let you know why that particular medication costs what it costs. Why don't we have that kind of transparency? Because people don't demand it. But you know what? The times are changing. And we have a device. Every one of you has one of these. You can look things up. You've got power in your hands, and I'm going to suggest to you that you have to use it. We can sit up here as experts, and we all know each other, and we work hard together, and we work around the tides that change in Austin, Texas. But the steady streams are those that are running through your communities. I'm going to put it on you. Get active. Get engaged. That's how you change the system. Will it be immediate? No. Will there be disagreements? Of course. We, we're, we've lived with them forever. Figure it out and get engaged. That's what I'm going to say about that. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, next question. I don't have a question. I wanted to make a comment, and thank you all for taking the time. Um, I know you all love rural health care as I do. Um, we are doing a project through the Coalition of Health Services called Gateway to Health Careers. And for those that don't know about it, I wanted to let you know because we are working this year with 21 independent school districts across the panhandle, Canadian being one. And we've got champions in that community with the ho partnering with the hospital, with the school district, with the nursing home, which we are doing in other communities as well, basically taking what Dr. Henderson mentioned, growing your own, inspiring those students to become involved or interested in health careers, regardless of what it might be, and providing the vehicle for them to be able to experience that while they're in high school and um, be able to continue their education with the intent of uh, hoping those students will go back to their community to practice because that is such an integral part of a community. My mantra for many years has been healthy communities. And healthy communities is just not health care. It's economic. It's every aspect of your community. And so hopefully by inspiring these students um, to do that, we have 500 students this year across the panhandle involved in Gateway. Thanks to AHEC and their support, West Texas, Emerald College, it's a great partnership. Well, thank um, you so much that. for that information. I appreciate it. Um, next question. Yes, I don't have a question as well. I just have a, a <laughs> little bit of information. OK, does anyone have a question? I'm sorry, can we, can we go to the question and then if people want to stick around afterward to, to chat with the panelists, they can, they can do that. Okay. I'd like to address my question to Dr. Jeffries, if I could please. Um, with this new executive order that's come through, 
um, there's a call for nurse practitioners to practice to the highest level of their, their, their degree. How is that being addressed in Texas? I know there's many states that um, have full practice rights. The VA has full practice rights. Where are we with nurse practitioners? Well, actually, um, earlier in October, Governor Abbott actually sent out a letter to the state agency heads that requested they look at not just nurse practitioners specifically, but all occupational licensing and regulation, and, and basically, for lack of better words, debulk that and quit making it so difficult because it's not only the ones that are here where, where we need that red tape, if you will, decrease, but I mean, we've got great candidates moving into our state. There's a thousand people moving into our state every day. And um, we've got great candidates who have license in other states and to get licensed in Texas, they, it may be a year down the road and we could use them. We could use their, you know, we could, I, I actually had someone that worked um, in the military um, so in the military, they can practice with full practice authority. She was a nurse practitioner, and she came to Texas, and I said, oh, no, no, we have a lot of paperwork to do before you can start practicing, and she was appalled, didn't really realize that, and decided, I'm out of here. So she went next door to New Mexico, where she can practice. So that's a really, you know, that's, Governor Abbott is, did send that out. I think those agencies had till De December 1st, I believe, to get back with him and, and put out forth their recommendations. So hopefully we're moving somewhere in that direction. Thank you, Thank Dr. You so Jeffries. Much. I think we might have time for one more question. You may have picked the wrong person to ask the last question. Uh oh. <clears throat> as y'all are aware, Department of State Health Services <clears throat> serves as the local health department for those counties that don't have one. Up here in the Panhandle, that's 24 of the 26 counties that we have. What do y'all see as the role of the Department of State Health Services in assisting those counties? Dr. Henderson, do you want to address that? I'm not sure I can address that very well. I um, have not had to depend on the state health because we have uh, adequate manpower there, so I'd Right. Maybe Dr. Phillips knows more about that than I do. I don't know. Okay. Well, that's Don Nicholson, y'all, uh, mm -hmm. Region 1 uh, Public Health Department. And I'm going to tell you, he's a great warrior for public health and people in this part of the world. I mean, we take a lot for granted. Um, immunizations, um, the, the whole notion of training uh, for uh, recognition of communicable diseases. Uh, I get a call about once a month from Don. It's generally friendly, but it's also a request for a training facility in our place so it can be at no cost to the health department. Um, infrastructure. Uh, Y'all are going to go eat after this if you didn't consume one of these lunches that was provided. Uh, who is it that inspects your uh, restaurants and eating facilities? to be sure they're safe and clean. I mean, that's just a few of the things that health departments do. But they're increasingly charged with looking at things like social determinants. And that's a word that's getting confused too. But it means housing, it means transportation, it really it means a whole host of things that can affect a person's health. Food supply, it's gonna take cooperation and coordination and the people who can do that are and know how to do that are in public health departments we have a little crisis out here in west texas uh, despite our masters of public health program at texas tech university health sciences center uh, soon maybe hopefully a doctorate we mostly are populated with people who are avocationally trained in public health not formally trained uh, it, for the longest time, up until just a few years ago, we only had two physicians that had public health training. We produced five, we produced five a year now in our medical school graduating class. The solutions you seek, I'm going to end with this, the solutions you seek are not quick, but if we're thoughtful about it, they can be lasting. And you have to get engaged. You have to sit on your school boards. You have to be on your public health committees. You have to get involved with your, your city councils. You have to do what good citizens do. 
if you want the outcomes of good health. Mm -hmm. And we'll do what we have to do to be in service to you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you to all the panelists. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming.